Thank, thank you for uh, the introduction, although you first said I don't need any. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's true. I've been in Singapore for 15 years now, and uh, in preparing this talk, which is one of the colloquia that, that we are <coughs> given um, about uh, 10 years of CQT, I was, of course, sort of thinking about the things that have happened since, and um, some of these things are so long ago that I hardly remember now. <coughs> so I, I, will, I will talk about the research of the past, uh, maybe f four or five years most, uh, essentially. And so this is a question that we have been discussing in, in my group about um, what do the data tell you, the data that you get from, from quantum experiments, and I will be a little bit more specific about this in a short while. But before I, m I move on, I, I should mention that there's a lot of people who are involved, so it's really a large team and I want to, in, in particular, mention uh, Zhang Wei Shan, who, who was uh, the, the first to make ma major contributions to this this subject. <coughs> Unfortunately, he is no longer with us. He's working for our competitors now. Okay, <laughs> but names are names. I mean, here are faces. Okay, so there is Hui Kun, who is in the audience. Uh, Zhang Wei, who, as I said, is a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, no, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy that he moved on. Uh, uh, Jing Hao, Jibo, Ying Lung, Xi Kun, uh, so those, those are people who <coughs> were and are involved, and there's Max and Jun Yan and Yan Wu, and then we have also benefited enormously from, um, uh, of course, people in the past who, who were here uh, contributed to, to this estimation problems at an early stage. Arun, who is, by the way, coming to visit us next week. Yong Xia, who is now a um, um, junior faculty in Korea in Seoul. <coughs> and, and Bo Yu, who moved on after getting his master. And then we have the senior colleagues uh, from statistics. Uh, <coughs> David from uh, next door. <coughs> uh, our own statistics department, Mike Evans, a uh, 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 towering figure in, in statistics at the University of, of Toronto. So without these people, we would never have been able to uh, make the progress that we uh, managed to make. So let me, let me uh, skip the abstract okay? and to talk about, just introduce you to the kind of system that I want to discuss. So imagine you have such a typical uh, source of entangled photon pairs in these experiments as they are done downstairs, but now also using satellites. And then uh, one of the photons is detected by Alice, one of the photons is detected by Bob. <coughs> and there are all kinds of optical elements, beam splitters, uh, polarizing beams, the half-wave plates. Anyway, so Alice has uh, four detectors in total, Bob has four detectors in total. They have uh, um, um, imperfect deficiencies, which are these numbers eta 1, eta 2, and so forth, on both sides. And then you get data from, from this experiment. <clears throat> okay, so, so you get clicks of these detectors, and then that's, that's the data that you have, a certain sequence of clicks. Uh, <clears throat> for example, you want to find out what is the state emitted by the source, what are the properties of these states. <clears throat> but it could also be that you don't really know what are these detection efficiencies, you want to also estimate them from the data. <clears throat> and I, I already mentioned the uh, uh, satellite experiments. Imagine that this is uh, Alex's uh, source in the satellite, and this is all uh, Bob in the satellite, uh, but, but between here and this detection is a whole atmosphere. <coughs> and then you take data, <coughs> and then you, you kind of uh, find out what is the uh, uh, <coughs> chance that the photon actually makes it from the satellite to, to uh, uh, the detection place. <coughs> but the next time that satellite comes around, the atmosphere is in different conditions, so you have to estimate that again. Right? So, so you, really, you really need the data for estimating not just properties of the source, but also properties of the whole setup. Okay, so what is, the, what is the detection probability and so forth. So, so uh, <coughs> the recorded data uh, that we get, so the recorded data is this many clicks of that detector, that detector, and that detector, actually a particular sequence of clicks. <coughs> and and uh, because this is a... Uh, a quantum experiment, uh, <coughs> there are uh, statistical aspects to that. I mean, nothing is predictable about it. For the next photon to come, you don't know which detector it will click. You can't even prepare it in such a way 
that you make sure that certain detectors click. That's completely impossible. <coughs> so, so the data is statistically in nature. It comes with all kinds of statistical fluctuations, and they are unavoidable. It doesn't help to take more and more data. You will still have fluctuations. So, so you have to cope with that. <coughs> and in the situation that I was just describing, so this is the satellite and there's the atmosphere, and every time you take new data, atmospheric conditions are different, so you are not really repeating the experiment. Every experiment has to be evaluated on its own. Okay, so, so, so you cannot rely on taking a, a large amount of, of data all taken under the same conditions. <coughs> so you face the question, uh, what really can you conclude from the data that you get from a single run of this experiment? Okay. So the question is then, what then do these data tell us about, say, the two photons say, emitted by the source and, and perhaps the other parameters? So I will now abstract from this and, and uh, introduce a little bit of terminology that I will need to rely on during the talk. <coughs> so we have a source. The source emits um, independently and identically prepared quantum information carriers, say photons or atoms, and then they are measured uh, by, by uh, well, um, a usual kind of measurement that, that implements a probability operator measurement that has capital K outcomes. And if you know uh, the source and you know what is happening here, quantum mechanics tells you to use Born's rules to calculate the probabilities that the next uh, uh, quantum system emitted will be detected by detector 1, 2, 3, and so forth, right? So those are these probabilities. However, these things you don't measure because what you, the data that you get is a certain number of clicks of this detector, this detector, this detector, this detector. Now, you can take these numbers of clicks and divide by the total number, <clears throat> but the numbers that you get are not the probabilities. They are the, the relative frequencies for that particular run. Okay? And they may even have properties that the probabilities are not allowed to have. So the actual data consists of these detector clicks in one particular sequence uh, upon measuring so and so many copies. <clears throat> and then okay, the first question that, that you have to address, but something that we have put aside, but um, uh, Max is working on this problem now. H how do we even verify that the sequence of clicks is typical? <laughs> Let me kind of ex explain uh, what I mean with that. S suppose the experiment is not like this, much easier. We are tossing a coin, okay? And I tell you I have a thousand coin tosses and there were 490 heads and 510 tails. <clears throat> and now I want to, you to guess uh, or to tell me how, how sure can I be that this is a fair coin? Okay. Well, then you, you go and work, and then next day I say, oh, I forgot to tell you, yeah, that when I tossed the coin, I had the 490 heads first, and then I got 510 tails in a row. Okay. Once you hear that, you become very skeptical of the data. Right? Why? Because the data is not typical for the experiment. Right? There are correlations in the data that shouldn't be there. Okay. So, so, uh, <clears throat> how do we know whether the data are typical or not? And if they are not typical, well, then what do, you, what do you do? Okay, so this is, this is something which is sort of uh, uh, in everybody's, everybody should be aware of this question, uh, but, but uh, um, it's usually not even mentioned when data is evaluated. <clears throat> so the state estimation problem is now to exploit the data from such an experiment for an educated guess about uh, these probabilities. Yeah. <clears throat> and then once you have done that, uh, then you can try to convert these probabilities, the guess for the probabilities, and the guess about the state, if you can, because you may not be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm uh, ignoring here the problem of also estimating other parameters, like the probability <laughs> to make it through the atmosphere. So let me just, let me just stick to the, the simpler scenario where, where we don't have such additional uh, unknowns. So um, anything you do, you should, you should kind of scratch your head and say, what, kind, what are the guiding principles that you have for this uh, kind of work? So uh, the m most important first principle in all of this stuff is that you should never do something that violates common sense. Okay? You, should, you should have a down-to-earth approach. And uh, I, I will have an, uh, an example later where you see how common sense can easily be violated. Now, so we, we estimate these event probabilities from the data after measuring in copies. And when we are done with this, 
<coughs> then we determine an estimator for the state <coughs> from the estimated probabilities. <coughs> and if necessary, we, we may have to invoke additional criteria, such as uh, James's maximum entropy criteria. This is always the case if, if uh, the probabilities that you have here do not uniquely uh, determine the state, but you want to have your best guess for the state. Then you need to invoke additional criteria. The, the, other, the other strategy is to not try to have such a so-called point estimator, just one value, but find a whole region in the space of these probabilities such that it contains the true probabilities with some likelihood. After all, these estimators almost surely will not be equal to the true probabilities. Okay? That's the, the, you would have to be uh, extremely lucky for su such a thing to happen. But, but rather, you have errors in the measurement, and, and uh, maybe just because there are statistical fluctuations. So, so the best you can really do is, is uh, uh, identify a region in the probability space or in the parameter space, uh, a region to which you can assign a certain probability that the true state is inside. <clears throat> and so once you have done that for, for, for the region in the probability space, then with the same caveat that you have here, you co can co convert this into a corresponding region in the space of the statistical operators. <laughs> and so if you do steps one, common sense, estimate probabilities, and then convert it into a state estimator, you will get a point estimator, as I just mentioned. In the other case, you get an estimator region, which you can think of as supplementing the point as uh, estimated with error bars of sort. But these are highly dimensional error bars, a whole, uh, a whole ball around the point estimator. <coughs> so <coughs> here's uh, a remark. The data, as I said, is this how many detector clicks, or actually a particular sequence. You convert this in the estimators for the probabilities, and that's what the data tell us. <coughs> the conversion from the probabilities to the statistical operator is very often not unique. And then you need those additional criteria that I mentioned. <coughs> you want to have a certain property of these estimators, namely that if you take more and more data, which of course is a sort of something which is virtual and, and not real, because any, any real life experiment will have a finite amount of data, so you cannot actually uh, do an experiment where you uh, uh, continue forever. <coughs> but you, you should be able to kind of check that your procedure is such that in such limit, the, the estimators convert towards the true values. Here is a warning, namely that in quantum mechanics, where the statistical operator really encodes what you know about the system, this is largely a tautology. Because what you know about the system is what you conclude from all the data. And then, of, of course, uh, uh, in, in this sense, it will always converge towards the, the true value, namely the one that, that you associate. Concerning the uh, common sense, I recommend uh, to browse through Edwin James's posthumous book uh, on probability theory, The Logic of Science. And uh, you read it, but then uh, after finished reading, don't ignore the advice that you are receiving there. <laughs> and uh, for, for other pertinent statistics literature, I draw your attention to Mike Evans's uh, recent book on measuring statistical evidence using relative belief, which is very much in the spirit of what we are doing here. Okay, so um, <coughs> uh, something technical, which uh, may, maybe uh, I just need to mention because I've already started to mention it. <coughs> so, so in the space of the statistical operators, uh, we have what we call the reconstruction space, <coughs> which allows us to have a one-to-one -one mapping between the probabilities and, and the uh, statistical operators. So rather than saying anything general about it, let's look at an example. Suppose we are estimating qubit states, then the qubit state has three parameters, x, y, and z, the expectation values of the Pauli operators. <coughs> but we could have a four-outcome measurement, just like in, in what you saw earlier for Ellis and Bob, <coughs> where, where on one side you are just getting some information about x and z, but you get no information about y. And so what you then can estimate from, from, uh, um, from, uh, from the data <coughs> is, is something on the x, z plane, but you have no information about y. So if you now want to assign a particular state to the data, well, any function y of x and z that, that you, you want to choose is just fine. So you can stay on, on the disk defined by the xy plane, or you can take the hemisphere above the disk or whatever, right? <coughs> you, but you have to be honest in what you are reporting that you really have no clue about y because your data don't tell you, okay? <coughs> 
at best, x and z restrict the range of y, but they don't, they don't tell anything about the value of y. <coughs> so however, once you have chosen this disk or the hemisphere, then that's your reconstruction space. Okay. <coughs> All the work that we do is, in, is done in the probability space. We are not really working in the con construction space. We are working in the probability space, which is a parameterization of the construction space, if you like. That probability is unique, uh, probability space unique and convex, and that's where we work. The reconstruction space is usually not unique, and is often, often the situation is such that you can't even choose it such that it is convex. Okay. Now, because we have quantum constraints, and in this particular example, <coughs> the, the constraints that p the probabilities 1 and 2 add up to a half, and 3 and 4 add up to a half, has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, so that would even be true of these x and z were classical variables. However, they have a quantum origin, and because of that, you cannot have all values allowed by this and that. You can only have those values where the sum of the squares are less than some upper limit, 3 8 in this case. So, and then you have st uh, estimation strategies for x and z from the data, which are just those of classical state estimation. And the quantum mechanics enters the problems only through constraints of this kind. So quantum state estimation is nothing but classical state estimation with quantum constraints. So um, it's not a, a, you know, a, a new exciting field of, of science. It's just a, a minor extension of what people do in, in classical state estimation. And there are a lot of papers where people take things well known in classical state estimation, translate it into quantum language, and uh, send it to a prestigious journal. <coughs> Now, for the point estimators, there's a couple of, of uh, popular strategies. <laughs> there's, uh, first, I want to mention the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I put the uh, Stenek Stratil here as a name because Stenek is the one who really pushed uh, this and ad was advertising it, advocating it, and still is. <clears throat> and so, so uh, uh, what you do there, there is a you have a, a likelihood for the data, I was uh, explaining in, in a few words, which is telling you how likely is the data that you have observed uh, conditioned on what is your state. And then you're, you're, you choose the state for which this likelihood is largest, and that's, that's then your, your maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, just as the, the, um, the conversion from prob probabilities to states may not be unique, uh, that you could have a whole uh, convex set of of maximum likelihood estimators where every one of them is equally good. <coughs> then um, Vlado Buzek's uh, uh, favorite at, at one time was the so-called maximum entropy estimator <coughs> where you, you have your measurement um, operators <coughs> and of course their expectation values are the probabilities <coughs> and so you, you want to maximize this uh, under the constraint uh, that these, these uh, uh, things are the probabilities, but then we don't know the probabilities. <coughs> we only have an estimate for, a, for, the, for the probabilities from these relative frequencies. <coughs> so you have to determine these Lagrange parameters from a different principle, which gives you the same thing if these are the probabilities, but gives you something, an, an estimate of a different kind. And then, oops, why, why did I get the whole page? But anyway, then there is the so-called Bayesian mean estimator, where you take the likelihood and you sort of calculate an average value of your state uh, by, by the uh, posterior distribution. Uh, Robin Bloom Kohut was advertising that at, at one time. Uh, it's not a very popular choice and I would even advise against it because you can easily have a posterior distribution which has a peak here and a peak there. And if you now say my best guess is a weighted average of the quantity from that, you will find the value in between for which you have no evidence. Okay? You have evidence for values here, you have evidence for values here, but you don't have evidence for the values in between. This can very easily happen with a Bayesian mean estimator. So um, it's not a recommended procedure. So the quantities that I introduced here, the Z of lambda is, of course, the partition functions that you know from statistical physics. The <laughs> quantity here, this likelihood, well, it's just the probability for, of, of obtaining the data if rho is the state. So for the given rho, you can calculate the probabilities. You take them to the powers, how often you get the uh, respective detector clicks. And the product of all these numbers gives you the likelihood. Since these probabilities are all less than one, 
and if you have a lot of data, these integers are very large. This can be a very small number. Okay? It, and then maximizing it is just finding the largest one of all those small numbers. Okay, why is it a small number? Because if you have a lot of data, there's many different ways of distributing the data. Right? For each of those, you have a likelihood. All these likelihoods have to add up to one. So since there's a large, a very large number of them, the individual ones uh, tend to be small. Okay. <coughs> then uh, the D rho that appears here is the prior probability for an infinitesimal space element at stage rho. So this is, this is the probability that you, as, you assign uh, uh, to, to a, a vicinity of rho before you take any data. So this incorporates everything you know about the experiment before you take data. <coughs> and then uh, the, uh, if you, you uh, integrate the likelihood over this, uh, conditioned on, on, on the say you integrate over all state, gives, that gives you the, the likelihood for obtaining the data which appears as a normalizing factor here. Uh, uh, a nice, a nice uh, a book, uh, more than 10 years old by now, unfortunately, is, is this, this uh, volume by uh, Matteo Paris and, and Yada Rehacek on quantum state estimation where many of these things are discussed. Now I want to say something about um, uh, these point estimators. So as, we all, as we, I already mentioned, we call such an estimator uh, for a quantity mu, which I write mu hat, and depends on the data. We call that consistent if it goes towards a true value as, as the, you get more and more data. <laughs> then we call the estimator unbiased if the expected value of all estimators, where the expectation is taken over all thinkable data, okay? So all different ways of distributing the uh, uh, data over the detector clicks. <laughs> if you take this uh, as expected value and if it's equal to the true value, uh, then we, we call the uh, estimator unbiased, and otherwise it's biased. <clears throat> so where, where, where is this terminology useful? Well, where, where does it even appear? Well, if you look at the mean squared error, <laughs> then you can write the mean squared error, <laughs> which is the expected value of the estimator minus the true value squared, as something which, which vanishes if this is true. So this measures the bias. And then there is something which just has to do with the estimation procedure, which is called the variance of the estimator. Now, here is a caveat. <coughs> Usually removing the bias, so in, in insisting that your estimator is unbiased, well, it makes this thing vanish, but it doesn't minimize the mean square error. Because the mean square error has two contributions. If I make one zero at, at the cost of increasing the other one, I'm not doing myself a favor. Okay? Nevertheless, this is a very, very much enforced procedure. And there are lots of theorems about these uh, unbiased uh, um, estimators, like the involving Fisher information, kramer rauhbaum and so forth. Right? <coughs> now let me give you an example. Suppose you have a random variable x, so this is very, very standard with unknown mean and unknown variant x and was normally distributed. So the kind of thing that as a student you meet in your first year uh, lab sessions, right? And then you are told you calculate the mean value like this. And the variance of the data is given by this expression. However, if you look at the expected value of the variance of the data, it's not equal to, to mu, but it, it differs from it. So this estimator, if you take the variance of the data as estimator, has a bias, okay? has a negative bias. Now, uh, if you look at the maximum likelihood estimator, well, that's just equal to the V of D. So the maximum likelihood estimator has a bias. Now, we can have an unbiased estimator, but we just take this and divide by this number, then we have an unbiased estimator, okay? And this is actually a formula. Calculate the uh, uh, variance by dividing, not by N, but by N minus 1, which all of us have seen in the first year lab, okay? And uh, Speaking about myself, when I asked well, why do we divide by n minus 1 and not by n, I didn't get an answer okay, from the instructors. Okay? I got a silly reply, like, if you have only one data, you can't ca calculate the variance. Okay? Well, um, <laughs> and, and this is why we divide by n minus 1. Okay? But the real, the real reason, which I only understood m much later, is that uh, by doing this, you remove the bias. Now you have an unbiased estimator. But I said, uh, removing the bias, you make this vanish, yeah, but it comes at a price. And the price is such that if you really want to minimize uh, the, the mean squared error, you shouldn't remove the bias, you should double the bias. Okay? So you should divide by n plus 1 rather than n minus 1. 
then you have an estimator which minimizes the mean squared error. Okay? Now, all of this refers to all thinkable data. Now, I'm, I'm, of course, asking why should I even worry about all thinkable data. I have one, there, I have one run and it gives me one set of data. Yeah, that's the data I have to evaluate. Okay, why should I even be concerned with all thinkable data? <laughs> However, um, of course, there is this school in statistics, the frequentists, where probability is even defined only as, as a procedure when n goes to infinity. <laughs> so for them, the concept of confidence regions, uh, which have a, a certain coverage, <coughs> uh, is important. And what, what does that mean? Okay, so here in this understanding, the unknown state is what it is. We just don't know it. And then the data and the confidence regions that you associate with the data. So for one measurement, you have this region. I mean, symbolically here for another set of data, you get this region. For a third set of data, you get this region. <coughs> And, and so these regions, the data and the regions are considered the random, the random uh, um, uh, variables. <coughs> and so you have one run. This is just uh, you know getting a lottery ticket, just one lottery ticket. So there could be many others, but this is the one. Yeah? Now you try, try to say something about the lottery as a whole, not about your ticket, but about the lottery as a whole. So your lottery ticket is one of these regions. And now you, you create these regions such <coughs> that whatever is the true state here, the red dot, yeah, it's contained in, say, 90% of the regions. So 90% of the regions uh, that, uh, that you get from the data will contain that state. I mean, with, the, uh, of course, uh, the statistical weights that the regions get for the particular state. Okay? Now, <coughs> credible regions is a completely different uh, uh, way of looking at it. Here, the actual data is what it is. And the inferred region, say, with 90% credibility, is supposed to contain the true state with 90% probability. Okay? So here you know that 90% of the regions cover the true state. Here we know that the state is in the one credible region with 90% probability. These statements sound awfully similar, but they are really very, very different. Okay? They don't mean the same thing. And then for us, this is the, uh, the game that we are playing. And then we want to know what is the smallest of all the credible regions. So there are many credible regions which will have 90% credibility. So of all of those, we want to know the smallest one because that's the most definite statement we can make about the data. <coughs> okay, so here's some more recommended reading. And there's a very entertaining article some 20 years old in the American Journal of Physics by Cousins. Why isn't every physicist a Bayesian? <coughs> so... Um, Let's look at these uh, confidence intervals and credible intervals. Uh, so, so James, in this posthumous book that I mentioned, doesn't really spend much, much uh, ink on discussing confidence intervals. Uh, but he has this, this uh, remark that they, they are satisfactory as infer inferences only in those special cases where they happen to agree with the credible intervals after all. Okay? So let's look at an example. Okay? Suppose you have a certain process that runs well up to time capital T, and then it starts to fail at a rate R, whereby just we have a, a Poissonian process that the failure occurs uh, after the after uh, time t after 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 capital T, <coughs> and so this is a process which has uh, rate R, <coughs> and so this is the probability that the failure happens between time t and time t plus dt. Now you take your measurement. Okay. And in the first run, you find failure at 10 time units. The second run, you have failure at 12 time units. And the third run, you have failure at 15 time units. Okay. So question now, what is the 95% confidence interval for T? And what is the 95% credible interval? Okay. You can work this out. And I assure you, it's worked out uh, uh, correctly applying the rules of the game. Okay. And what you find is that... Uh, one standard way of calculating a confidence interval gives you this. And the smallest credible interval is this. Now, so if you are in this business of confidence intervals, this is what you get. But however, since the smallest time that you recorded is 10, and the capital T cannot be later than 10 units of time, okay, your whole interval 
yeah, of 90% uh, confidence, so to say, is outside. Okay? It's completely useless. The data tell you that this, that this interval does not contain the true value. Okay? You don't have to guess. The data, the data tell you. Yeah. <coughs> so most certainly, this confidence interval does not contain the actual value. So you are violating my principle number one. Yeah? You are violating common sense. <clears throat> now, this, this is, of course, an, uh, once you have seen how this example works, you can construct many more of the same kind. So confidence intervals, uh, uh, let me put it this way, you shouldn't have too much confidence in them. Okay? <clears throat> now, I, I said that we want to have the credible reasons, and, and they should be small. So let me, let me uh, uh, say something about that. So we need to, we need to um, explain what we mean when we talk about the size of a region. So the region is something in an abstract space. So if, for example, you want to estimate the two-qubit state, well, you know, that's, a, that's a state in a 15-parameter space, and it doesn't come with, with, with a, a, a pre-made uh, notion of what you call a volume there yeah, and how you measure it. So you have to, you ha you have to think of that. So, Suppose you have a pre-existing notion of size in that. For some reason, you know what, what you will call a large region, what you will call a small region then. And scale all such sizes such that your reconstruction space has, um, size, has unit size. And then you assign the same prior content to regions of the same size. So if you take uh, the whole volume, which is now one after normalization, if you have something which has a half volume and half volume, well, then, then your pre-assignment of probability should be 50% for this and 50% for that, and so forth. So the size and the probability are just, are just the prior probability are just pro proportional to each other. But maybe you don't have a pre-existing notion of size. Then you choose a prior of your liking. Well, the prior, as I said, is not really ambiguous. It should correctly reflect what you know about the experiment before you take data. And then you measure the size of a region by its importance in this context, which is just its prior content. <laughs> and then in either way, you, f you find, end up with the size of a region being identical to the prior content. So you integrate the prior measure for, that you have on the region over whatever is the region of interest. And then when we now say sampling uniformly from the state space, well, that's just sampling in accordance with the prior. <laughs> so if somebody says, uh, give, give me an, an, an arbitrary, a random uh, two-qubit state, okay? The question is random by which measure, okay? So, and, and exactly when you, when you define what you call the random state, this is a statement about your prior. And then the credibility of a region is just a posterior content. So you, you have the, uh, uh, the likelihood for the data, you normalize this to the overall likelihood, and that gives you the posterior region. Then we want to have the smallest credible regions. And it turns out that they are very easily characterized. So smallest credible region with, uh, with parameter lambda, that's just lambda is just a number between 0 and 1, is such that for the points inside the region, the point likelihood is larger than lambda times the maximum of all point likelihoods, which is, of course, just the likelihood that you have for the maximum likelihood estimator. So, so uh, you, if you ask yourself, well, if I look at all the regions with the same uh, credibility and I want to have the smallest one, that's it. Right. So it's very easily characterized. Now, uh, the smallest credible regions, of course, are nested. If the lambda 1 is larger than the lambda 2, then that region is, uh, lambda 1 region is inside the lambda 2 region because you have this uh, simple criterion. The set of these regions, yeah, the set of these regions does not at all depend on your choice of prior. Okay, what depends on the choice of prior is the size and the credibility and, and for the region. But which region you have to consider, uh, which set of regions, is completely independent of the priors. It's entirely determined by, by your likelihood function, which means by the data. And then each of these regions contains the maximum likelihood point estimator. And this is a result, it's not a feature that is put into the construction. So we didn't set out trying to find error bars on maximum likelihood estimators. <coughs> but I think it's a very nice argument in support of using maximum likelihood estimators as your point estimators. 
So the size of such a region is then uh, a size which depends on lambda, and you get it by just integrating over the region, or you integrate over the whole reconstruction space and have a step function selecting the region. And for the credibility, you have a similar formula. And now what is really nice and really useful in practice is that this is the only thing that you have to calculate numerically. This you then get from integrating S as, as a function of lambda. Okay? And of course, for these integrals, for these integrals, we need to integrate over high dimensional spaces. So for two qubits, this d rho is a 15 dimensional integral. Okay? So the only method you have for that is Monte Carlo integration, which means that you need to sample from the state space according to your prior. Now your prior is usually uh, very uh, widely distributed, so it's easy to sample for it. It's much easier than from the posterior because the posterior has the likelihood here as a factor, and that's usually a function which is very narrowly peaked, maybe in one place, maybe it has several peaks, but they are very narrow peaks, very difficult to sample from that. But we don't have to because we have this connection. <coughs> and then uh, you just show a plot of S of lambda and C of lambda, and that reports the smallest scalable regions. And of course, there is this technical challenge of doing these integrals, and so we needed to develop suitable sampling algorithms, but I don't think I will have time to talk about that. And then once you have that, then these random samples are also useful for other applications. For example, you want to know if I have a random two qubit state, I mean, uh, what is the probability that the uh, discord is below 0 0.2 or so, right? I mean, Latko may be interested in that question, okay? You have, then you look at your sample, you just count how many are, are of this kind and how many are above the threshold, and you know. But it, of course, depends on how you define what is a random state, how you choose your prior. Okay, so here are some examples of some uh, 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 early data that we, we looked at. So this is uh, just simulating a simple measurement of a, a qubit we are just measuring in the xz plane. And you can use the crosshair measurement where you measure sigma x and sigma z, which has four outcomes, and you have discounts in these simulations. So there are two, two, uh, two measurements. These, these triangles are the maximum likelihood estimators, and these, these things around them are those smallest credible regions. The star marks the, the true state that's used for the, for, the, uh, uh, for, the, for the simulation of the experiment. So here you have the S lambda, C lambda, S lambda, C lambda curves. You can read off. So you want to have a credibility of 80%. You go here, this is your lambda value. Okay? And this is then the size of the smallest region of this kind. Now, of course, since we don't have a lot of data, just 24 copies measured, these regions are not really small. But if I would try to plot it for you, we say 240 copies, you wouldn't see anything. Okay? <coughs> what you can see in this plot, however, is that there are two sets of regions, the ones with the red boundary and the one with the blue boundary. Okay? And they are calculated for two quite different priors. Okay? And the lesson to be learned here is that it doesn't really depend on which prior you choose. Okay? There are small differences here, well, because we don't have that much data. If you get more data, things essentially become prior independent. Yeah. <coughs> now, <coughs> another concept which is important when you evaluate data, for example, you do experiments where you want to distinguish local hidden variable theories from quantum mechanics, yeah? and the question is, do the data give you evidence against or in favor of one or the other? So, um, question is, uh, you have a certain region in your parameter space. Do the, when do the data provide evidence in favor of, of uh, uh, parameters in that region? Well, <laughs> this is very simple. If your posterior content of the region is larger than the prior content, so once you get the data, you believe more strongly that the true set in this region than before, then the data give you evidence in favor of that region. Now, we can look at infinitesimal vicinities of a certain row, and then we have a evidence in favor of that row. If the point likelihood for that row is larger than the likelihood average over all rows. And so this, this uh, now says, in a sense, that the data provides strongest evidence in favor for the maximum likelihood point estimator. But as I said, we are not really interested in point estimator. We are interested in regions. And this concept allows us to define what is called a plausible region. So the plausible region contains all uh, the points for which the data 
uh, provides evidence in favor. Yeah? And so what is nice about this, because it gives you a critical value of this lambda, so you don't have to say, well, I'm, I'm applying a rule that 95% is always my threshold or 90% is always my threshold or 5% or, or uh, against is always my threshold. No, the data, the data select uh, uh, a critical value and give you a reason, say, for the points inside that region, they are supported by the data, the points outside are not. And uh, uh, one, one way of looking at this, the, the critical value is where the difference between credi uh, uh, credibility of, of the bounded likelihood region and, and size is the largest. So if we have a plot, like here, never mind what this example is about, so it's the size as a function of lambda and the credibility of, of the size of the lambda, the critical value is here. Here you have the largest vertical distance between the two graphs. And, and for this data, it's, it's over here. So this will identify uh, the critical lambda value. And then you see here that the, the credibility for the critical lambda value is 90% in this case, is 95% in that case. Okay. And the size here is about uh, uh, 0.2. And the size here, the critical value is 0.35. So this, this data gives stronger evidence, so to say, for the, for the plausible region than, than this one. OK, so let me see um, whether this works. Uh, so so what, I'm going, now going to show a little movie. And this movie is about estimating two parameters. Again, it's not important what the example is, but I tell you nevertheless. It's estimating the purity of a state and, and, at, and at the same time estimating the transmission probability of a beam splitter in the setup. So it's these two parameters that we are estimating. <coughs> and, and this is the situation after 10 copies have been measured. Then we have a plausible region which is like this. And we have a smallest credible region for 95% um, credibility which is like this. Now as we take more data, these regions will change. Okay. And uh, they will both get smaller, and eventually the uh, plausible region will be larger than the smallest credible region with 95%. So for the red, the red region will always have 95% credibility, and the uh, the black region uh, will, will always be the plausible region. Oops, ah. I knew it. Okay. You see how these regions uh, jump around and how they get smaller and how after uh, a couple of, of more measurements the plausible region is actually larger than the smallest credible region which has this fixed, fixed credibility. And you, you can actually work out how these, these things change. So the size of the critical region in this example uh, decreases like 1 over square root n and, and the, the credibility approaches unity with, with the same uh, power law. So as, as you see, these things can really be, be calculated in, in uh, real life examples. Now, <coughs> when you do this uh, state estimation, you usually have a certain purpose in mind. So for example, uh, you have an apparatus supposed to make uh, uh, two qubit, uh, uh, qubit, qubit pairs in a particular state a certain target state, and then you want to check whether what you get from the source is really the target state. Okay, so one procedure doing this is you estimate your state, and then you calculate the fidelity with the target state. Okay. So you estimate the state, gives you this kind of, of a region. Of course, this is in a high dimensional space, but I only can draw in uh, two dimensional things. So you have you uh, don't take these things literally. So this is a kind of um, indicating what, what you should imagine happens in 15 dimensions. So, and then so there's the maximum likelihood estimator, the, the, the most likely of all those states. But this is, say, the region with a certain uh, uh, credibility, smallest, smallest region with, say, credibility 90%. And now we, we want to estimate the fidelity with a target state. Now say, the, so this is some function of the state, and say it's constant along these lines. Okay. So what you should really consider are regions which are bounded by those lines. And then for those lines, you should apply this machinery. And then you get, you get uh, uh, credible intervals, plausible intervals, and so forth for that fidelity that you want to estimate. And your maximum likelihood, for the, uh, 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 maximum likelihood estimator for the fidelity 
uh, say, corresponds to this dotted red line, it's not the same as the fidelity you calculate from your estimated, from your best state of the guess. So your best guess for the fidelity in this example isn't going to be equal to the fidelity of your best guess of the state. Right? So if you really want to estimate the fidelity, estimating the state is not the right thing to do. <coughs> also, if you really estimate the state and you have a credible region with 90% credibility, and then you look what is the range of values for that fidelity, it's a rather large range compared to the range that you get if you estimate the fidelity directly. Okay? So we also need methods for estimating such functions of the state uh, uh, directly. Uh, and so for that, we then have concepts which are in the likelihood conditioned on f, which is this expression, very difficult to evaluate numerically because of the delta function. I can't do Monte Carlo integration if you have a delta function there. So, so we, we actually do Monte Carlo integration for the antiderivative of these things. And then we, we uh, uh, later, later uh, get the derivatives after estimating these things as a function of f. <coughs> and then what you're really calculating here is, uh, are marginals uh, from the point likelihood uh, for some values, and they are notoriously difficult to compute. But we do have algorithms for it. Um, and so I also should mention that if you are in the frequencies camp, your work stops here because you have no way of marginalizing. And so, so I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just telling you basically what you do. So, so you evaluate one of these integrals um, with Monte Carlo um, methods, choosing some prior, and you get a function like this for the numerator and the denominator. And then you have to differentiate. You have to divide the two. However, over here, uh, you, your slope is 0, and over there is your slope is 0. And now you have to divide 0 by 0. No way you can do this with uh, numerical data. Okay? <coughs> so we have an iterate, iteration method which takes us from this situation to that situation where the, the derivative is very well defined. And then we can differentiate and we can divide. And then we get likelihoods like these uh, uh, for, <coughs> for the parameter. So this is the parameter I want to estimate in this example. And you can see as you do this iteration, there's very little change here. So this is quite a stable procedure. And then you can use that to calculate uh, size and credibility as a function of lambda. And then you get your smallest credible intervals, uh, which depending a little bit on which prior you use, uh, is a little like this or like that. And the error indicates um, the true value used for the simulation. So it's not bad. Okay? And uh, I mean, here, here where, where the width of the interval is zero, this is where your maximum likelihood estimator is, is sitting. So let me summarize. So, uh, you know, nowadays summaries have to have take home messages. So here they are. Um, these bounded likelihood regions are the optimal estimator regions. They are optimal in the sense that they have, for the, for the pre-chosen credibility, uh, <coughs> they have the, large, the smallest size. Or if you pre-choose the size, then they have the largest credibility for that, for that size. And they, it turns out that they, they supplement maximum likelihood estimators with multidimensional error bars. And then we have efficient methods for the numerical implementation, and we are getting better at that. And if I still have time, I can elaborate. <coughs> and, uh, um, well, stop using confidence regions. I, I've shown you how, how dangerous that can be. Now, there are other applications that I didn't talk about. I mean, the photons um, that escape detections, they have inefficient detector efficiencies. They have to be accounted for. So it changes the expression for the likelihood. But once you have, you have the correct expression for the likelihood, it's ex exactly the same, same uh, procedure from then onwards. <coughs> and you can also estimate parameters of the measuring, measurement apparatus, such as the phase in an interferometer, efficiencies of detectors, uh, properties of beam splitters, and so forth. And you can do that jointly with, with estimating the quantum state. So these things are called self-calibrating experiments. And we can extend this procedure here described for estimating state properties. We can use the same philosophy and the same machinery to estimate um, the properties of quantum channels. And then, uh, well, you name it, we do it. Okay? And uh, 
if you have data, give it to us and, and we, we shall evaluate. Okay? Uh, at this point, I want to um, list a few references. So there's a books by Edwin James and, and Mike Evans that I mentioned earlier. So it's a list of, of publications that came out of the group. And uh, you see that Zhang Wei uh, uh, is quite prominent here. We also have a website with large ready to use random samples for, like you can use for all kinds of properties that, that you need them to. And there's open source software by which you can create your own random samples. And then I thank you for being such a nice audience. Okay. And I thank the group for the good work. Okay, thank you. <laughs>